Uh, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you so much uh, for that wonderful uh, introduction, Petra, and thank you for the introduction to the, uh, the, this, this wonderful institute, Stefan. And, and yeah, it's, it's just um, lovely uh, to yeah, be here face to face to talk to you and, and with you. Uh, so what I'm going to do today is, is basically, uh, I, I guess, do something a, a bit ambitious or high level, in, uh, but I'm going to root it in place. Uh, and, and that's to talk about industrial ruination, to revisit uh, that 2012 uh, monograph and the ideas of it, and how they've car carried with me or stayed with me and how I've moved them forward uh, in my more recent work. Uh, it's kind of a provocative uh, <laughs> uh, title, Planetary Industrial Ruination and, uh, and Just Transformations. Uh, it's, it's, meant, it's not meant to be some sort of grand theorizing. It's, it's more about thinking through. Uh, so what I'm going to do today is I'm for, first going to give you, yeah, as Petra alluded to, a sneak preview uh, from my forthcoming book, Petrochemical Planet, uh, from the preface, which tells a journey uh, from industrial ruination to my more recent uh, um, research and environment, and I hope will take you through the places and concerns and commitments that I've had on that journey uh, sort of in the spirit of, of yesterday's roundtable, for those of you who uh, attended it, uh, uh, reflecting on how research is always on some levels personal, especially when thinking about, uh, I guess, traumatic issues of, of deindustrialization, decline, loss, uh, rupture. Uh, so I'll begin. Uh, while plastics are visible in everyday life, the petrochemicals that comprise them are less visible. Derived primarily from fossil fuels, petrochemicals are the building blocks of polymers found in thousands of consumer products, from phones, cars, and computers, to windows, food packaging, and medical equipment. Many petrochemicals are toxic. The first time I saw a petrochemical plant up close was was in April 2013. I was in New Orleans doing research on labor struggles in the port, driving with a longshoreman to a crawfish boil at a seafarer center along the Mississippi River. We drove past fields, churches, and old plantations. But then, seemingly out of nowhere, we came across a massive petrochemical plant, metallic and looming, it felt like a scene out of a dystopian novel. I was struck by how alive the plant was. For years, I had been researching the impacts of industrial decline and post-industrial change, including the toxic legacies of the abandoned chemical industry in Niagara Falls. But I had only ever tackled the ruins and embers of manufacturing. As I soon learned, this was just one of 150 petrochemical plants clustered along an 85-mile stretch along the Mississippi River between New Orleans and Baton Rouge, infamously known as Cancer Alley. The plants are located on former slave plantation land, which was sold to oil companies and chemical companies in the early and mid-20th century, attracted by cheap natural resources and low taxes. Since the 1980s, Cancer Alley has been at the forefront of environmental justice battles over high levels of toxic pollution in rural black communities on the fence line of industry. Yet for all of these efforts, the toxic landscape remains. My introduction to Cancer Alley sparked the beginning of a new journey. Months later, I noticed similar petrochemical complexes from a distance along the maritime fringes of other port cities, Liverpool, Marseille, Antwerp. Most large petrochemical facilities are located in coastal regions near to ports for access to shipping lines. Tightly enclosed behind security gates, they resemble cities with tall towers and giant cylindrical storage tanks. Many have their own hospitals, fire brigades, and contractor villages. They flare and steam and crackle. How did these petrochemical plants relate to the ports? How do they work? How are they regulated? And what drives their operations? Who are the main 
pe global petrochemical players, and who are the biggest polluters? How do the environmental justice movements in Cancer Alley compare with activism, including labor activism, in different petrochemical communities around the world? These questions formed my next research project, Toxic Expertise, Environmental Justice, and the Global Petrochemical uh, Industry, funded by the European Research Council. A five-year, multi-sided sociological study of the global petrochemical industry in relation to corporate responsibility and environmental justice. This book, The Petrochemical Planet, is an attempt to bring together and to extend the myriad findings of the research, which spanned high-level industry meetings, petrochemical plant tours, and polluted communities in the US, China, and Europe, the top three chemical producing regions in the world. Now, engaging with questions of environmental justice requires a recognition of the ground that you stand on and your relations with land, people, histories, and non-human worlds. So do, too does research as a practice. In this book, I draw on both traditions, albeit unconventionally, across multiple sites, scales, and perspectives. It is a difficult thing to describe the ground that I stand on in relation to such a complex, vast, and extensive industry, but I will try. But the only way I can find is circuitous. So <laughs> I, I am a third generation mixed race Chinese Canadian. And I grew up in a small forest dependent town called Smithers in Northern British Columbia on the unceded land of the Wet'suwet'en people. I'm also a naturalized British citizen and I have lived in Coventry, once known as the UK's motor city for the past decade. Despite my training as a sociologist, and you may be surprised to think of this, <laughs> I've often felt uncomfortable about personal questions of identity. When I was a doctoral student at the London School of Economics, researching the industrial decline of shipyards in Newcastle-upon-Tyne, chemical factories in Niagara Falls, and textile fa factories in Ivanovo in Russia, a professor once asked me what my real story was. He was trying to identify some aspect of my personal history that could explain my research interests. I resisted this line of questioning. I responded that I had no personal ties to any of these places, and that my research was motivated by questions about the uneven geography of capitalist development. I can't remember how the conversation ended, but I was just left with the impression that I had provided an unsatisfactory answer. Since then, many years later, I have come to realize that the professor was right. The personal connection was not to specific places as such, but to working class experiences of deindustrialization. My maternal grandfather of Irish settler descent was a mill worker and my mother spent her childhood moving from one mill, mill town to another across Canada. They eventually settled in Mackenzie, a sawmill town, a, a, a sawmill town in northern British Columbia. This town went through decades of decline as a one-job town tied to the fortunes of the mill. And when I visited my grandparents, my aunts and uncles and cousins in Mackenzie as a child, I found it depressing, to be honest. <laughs> it was infused with the smell of pulp and cigarettes. Somehow this place was too close to look at directly. But this is just one story. A journey from the mill towns of northern British Columbia to the abandoned chemical factories in Niagara Falls to the petrochemical plants in Cancer Alley. Perhaps it is a little too neat. There is another more troubling personal story, which is perhaps more telling. Early in 2019, I was in my office at the University of Warwick, reading through toxic expertise researcher Tom Davies's field notes about resistance mobilizations over the construction of the Bayou Bridge oil pipeline in Cancer Alley. And as I searched for media articles about the pipeline, a related news story caught my attention. 
The Wet'suwet'en people in northern British Columbia were demonstrating over the construction of the coastal gas link pipeline through 190 kilometers across their lands, including my hometown. The natural gas pipeline would carry fracked gas from northeastern BC to the northwest coast to export to petrochemical markets in Asia. The Wet'suwet'en land defenders set up a blockade to prevent the pipeline construction, and they were forcibly removed from their territory by Canadian police officers, sparking solidarity protests from Indigenous groups and climate activists around the country. A rally was held in Smithers in January 2019 in support of the Wet'suwet'en people. It was a strange feeling to see photos of my hometown in the international news from the UK embroiled in fierce battles over environmental justice with the familiar snow-covered mountaintops in the background. So, after reading about the Wet'suwet'en pipeline resistance movement, I started digging. I discovered a book called Shared Histories, written by the geographer Tyler McCreary, who was in my brother's class at school, about the history of Wet'suwet'en and settler relations in Smithers. I learned some disturbing things about the history of my hometown. Also, a, saw, a sawmill town, but also a bit more diverse. I knew that the town was on Wet'suwet'en territory, but I, I knew little else. I found out that the house that I grew up in was part of a planned modern subdivision built in the 1970s, which displaced a Wet'suwet'en settlement known as Indian Town in Smithers. In all my years, I had never heard of Indian Town. It was a settlement that had grown on the fringes of Smithers since the 1920s, the only place in the town where the, where the authorities permitted the Wet'suwet'en people to live. It had very high levels of poverty due to systemic discrimination, including a lack of access to basic services such as waste collection. The adjacent local elementary school that I attended was also part of this planned displacement, along with a companion Christian school, a senior citizen's home, and leafy cul-de-sacs, all designed to foster a middle-class sense of community and public safety. I actually felt sick reading about my childhood landscape in McCreary's book, as if the ground beneath me had sunk. Smithers has an idyllic quality. It's nestled in the valleys, surrounded by mountains, glaciers, forests, canyons, lakes, and rivers. It's a 13-hour drive northeast from Vancouver. It was founded in 1913 as the divisional headquarters of the Grand Trunk Pacific Railway. It incorporated as the town in 1967. My parents moved to Smithers in 1975, attracted by the idea of starting a family in a small town. My father came from, suburb, um, from suburban Toronto, venturing west, far away to escape the expectations of his Chinese-Canadian family. And we met my mother during a summer job in Mackenzie. They married young, and my father joined an accountancy firm in Smithers while my mother stayed home to raise four children before finding work in the primary school. It was in this forest valley town built on a swamp, teeming with folk and country music, where I first gained a strong sense of place. I can still trace the contours of the valley in my mind, the way the snow crept down the mountain as winter approached, the winding dirt back roads and forest trails. But I also wanted to escape. Smithers is a majority white town with a population of 5,300 people. It's located on Highway 16 between Prince George and Prince Rupert, a 725 kilometer corridor known as the Highway of Tears because dozens of indigenous women have gone missing and been murdered along its length since the 1970s. Growing up, I often felt a sense of unease. There were so many judgments and assumptions in the public spaces of the town and violence was never far from the surface. I did not encounter many incidents of explicit racism despite being half Chinese or at least I didn't recognize them as such at the time. There were occasional barbed comments, but mostly I managed to ignore them. More often, I faced racist attitudes due to being mistaken for an indigenous person, 
I will not recount these experiences here, as I, they never felt like my own stories to tell. They did give me some insights, though, into racism. Despite the rhetoric of multiculturalism that was taught in the schools, there was tacit racism in the white settler community towards indigenous peoples, and tensions between Smithers and the nearby Wet'suwet'en village, which was located on a reserve. One time, when I was about 15, a Wet'suwet'en feast was held in my high school, led by an indigenous scholar, or sorry, a leader. Uh, and this was a rare uh, occasion for uh, cultural exchange. The leader's opening speech was full of accusations against the white settler Smithers community in ways of speaking that I had never heard before. I don't recall anybody talking about it later, none of my classmates or teachers, they just shared the food and went on with their day. But looking back, I wish I had asked more questions. It is clear to me now that the whole history of the settlement of the town, like many other communities across Canada and around the world, is one of environmental injustice. So Petrochemical Planet asks difficult questions about entanglement and complicity in the fraught relationships between petrochemicals, toxicity, injustice, and our planet. The violence of settler colonialism, systemic racism, and dispossession runs deep through the reckless global expansion of toxic and wasteful petrochemicals and the unfolding climate catastrophe. This violence is founded on willful ignorance, half-truths, and detached justifications. Confronting these questions has compelled me to move into further uncomfortable ground through studying up, examining corporate worldviews and logics with the aim of identifying levers for change. It has not been an easy journey to home in on the sources of injury and destruction, only to find that they're even worse than I had imagined, deeply rooted in a calculated war mentality. Throughout the waves of the COVID pandemic, I don't know how <laughs> you felt about it, everyone has their own experience. Uh, I've sometimes felt as though a snake was encircling my head, slowly tightening its grip. So engaging with these questions has been an ordeal. It's gotten under my skin, it's given me nightmares, and it's caused me to question long-held beliefs about human nature. I like to believe in the possibilities for transcendence in a Buddhist sense, and I don't believe in the idea of evil in the world. But it's been a difficult position to sustain. So this intervention is not only about conflict and injustice, though. It's also about the possibilities for repair through interconnection across multiple sites and scales, from the personal to the planetary, and from the human to the forests and mountains. The ground that we stand on is constantly shifting. This is a lesson in contingency, which opens up possible worlds. What started off as a project about global environmental injustice and the toxic impacts of the petrochemical industry has slowly expanded into a meditation on the wider stakes of ecological crisis, including the imp climate implications of doing research. The urgency of this task has propelled me to swing between registers of despair and of hope, writing during the pandemic, which has magnified existing social and environmental inequalities. Within the context of profound ecological crisis, this book asks uh, about the possibilities of radical and just transformations, despite the many barriers. This involves recognizing obligations to past, present and future generations, and the consequences of the stories that we tell ourselves. I wanted to share this <laughs> excerpt of a preface with you to sh show you kind of where I'm at, where I've come from, uh, and uh, how I took uh, this invitation uh, to talk about industrial ruination uh, as, a, as an opportunity to re revisit that work and how it's been a thread uh, uh, th through this journey. And so in this, in this uh, intervention, I want to propose an idea um, in terms of continuity of, of uh, planetary industrial ruination for a start. 
And I, I had an interesting exchange, actually, um, while I was writing this. I've now completed this manuscript, and it's going <laughs> off into um, production soon. Um, I, I, while I was writing this book, I was in exchange with uh, a, a scholar of, of, of settler colonialism and environmental justice, and, and they, they wrote to me, actually, and said, uh, kind of out of the blue, and said, I loved your book, <laughs> Industrial Ruination. And I, and I sort of, I mean, this is, it was written 10 years ago, uh, and I, I said, really? I mean, there's so many things I would do differently. I didn't address settler colonialism pretty much at all <laughs> uh, in, in this book, and that's a major omission, uh, given that I was talking about uh, Niagara Falls, uh, uh, although I did talk about environmental racism. And, and what this scholar said was, well, yes, that's an omission. Uh, and I just wanted to read, this is the last thing I'll read, <laughs> uh, what he wrote to me, because it really moved me and it made me think about how books have their own lives in a way and how ideas um, resonate for people at different times and how actually maybe he understood it better than I now understand it. Uh, so he said, while there is a clear industrial nostalgia in Niagara with obvious relationships to continuing projects of settler colonial extractivism, I also found something else. In this nostalgia, there was a different temporal logic than that of capital. What was really clear to me was that the logics of the spatial temporal fix and how it produces economic value has an incredibly sharp distinction from the ways that people fix themselves to places and create their own forms of social value in their lives. Your book enunciated how people not just indigenous peoples, but people writ large, have connections to place that exceed the logic of capital and its willingness to discard them. The point is perhaps obvious, um, but reading your book, it felt profound to me. Also hopeful. While this economic system is alienating us from something profoundly human in our connection to place, it is also possible that renewing that connection and recentering it could produce a different society. And so, I, I mean, I, I was just, I loved that. I mean, it was very nourishing and one always loves to hear nice things, but I thought, hopeful? Me? <laughs> you know, like 10 years ago, maybe I was more hopeful. Uh, and it is something that I really wrestle with. Uh, and, and probably, I mean, uh, many uh, working in about these kind of difficult issues um, wrestle with. And I think one of the threads that does go through this work, this focus on uh, industrial ruination and the impacts uh, on people's lives, is how uh, those processes, we, we brought up words like grief, trauma, loss, uh, those are, um, you could equally apply those to how many people feel about climate change. Uh, and, and there are a lot of uh, connections uh, to be found. So revisiting that work, uh, for the, those of you who aren't familiar with it, um, I mean, the basic um, idea of, was uh, about industrial ruination being a lived process. That, so this idea that um, although um, you might look at an industrial ruin at, at any given moment, it appears to be a snapshot in time and space, but actually that's located in a much longer process of industrial ruination. And later the ruin will inevitably go processes through processes of, of demolition or reuse or rebirth. But those snapshots of industrial ru ruination, those fragments of time, cannot be separated from those uh, social places or processes in which they're located. So I thought through some of the uh, shared experiences of industrial ruination in some of the places that I uh, researched and how those actually do provide some resources for thinking about industrial transformation and, and processes of industrial uh, ruination that are ongoing. Those in include uh, issues around uh, economic deprivation and exclusion, often racialized and and disproportionately affecting disadvantaged communities, uh, the toxic legacies of contamination, uh, the fact that the half-life or the, the, the protracted experiences of, of deindustrialization and decline, 
and a profound kind of ambivalence as well as an attachment to places, especially ones that are uh, damaging. But there were also, yeah, I guess the more hopeful sides were around uh, histories of community resistance and sol solidarity, these, these prolonged efforts to sustain and rebuild and, and reinvent, and, and a hope really for regeneration. But what I want to focus on, and, and this is going back to the kind of despairing <laughs> register uh, before the hope, uh, is on one aspect uh, that is also continuous in terms of uh, my research. So when I, one of the sites that I looked at in Niagara Falls uh, where, was where uh, there was the infamous Love Canal environmental disaster in 1978, which involved... Uh, the toxic dumping of, of, uh, from the Hooker Chemical Company uh, and the, the eventual relocation of the community uh, there. Uh, and it was sparked, you know, the, basically the, or it's attributed uh, to being the beginning of the environmental movement amongst other factors, uh, especially in the U.S. And so when I visited these sites of, uh, uh, these, in, these famous sites or infamous sites uh, where those buildings are no longer standing, uh, where they've been, been demolished. I called them an unseen ruin. Uh, so where what remains are the memories, uh, also uh, what remains are uh, the, yeah, the, the toxicity. And I guess you could say that about any place where you remember where, where, where uh, an industrial facility was, but it's no longer there. Uh, and so I think talking about industrial ruination in that context and talking about it on a planetary scale, uh, you could see how in the context of s socially and environmentally damaging industries like the petrochemical industry, there are many others, uh, but how those are uh, leading to uh, yeah, industrial ruination all around uh, the world. Uh, now, the idea of the planetary is something that I engage with uh, in, in my book, obviously, the, the petrochemical planet, but I'm extending to this idea uh, here of industrial ruination. Uh, th there have been many debates in recent years uh, within the so social sciences and in the humanities about this idea of the planetary as opposed to the global. Uh, so Deepesh Chakrabarti, a, a historian who has written uh, this book called The Climate of History in a Planetary Age, uh, where they say, well, yes, uh, the global is a really important category, and that's the way in which we often think about human history, capitalism, modernity, progress, all the kind of good things and bad things about the system. Um, but that's sort of the limits, in a way, of thinking about uh, modern history, I guess. Uh, and that actually thinking about the planetary invokes a different way of thinking about uh, time, effectively beyond human history, the 4.5 billion years of the Earth, and how uh, that clashes then um, with the, the temporal logics or ways of thinking about um, global capitalism. Uh, in a different vein, but sort of related, uh, Spivak has, has proposed that the planetary should actually replace the idea of the global because the global is quite homogenizing, universalizing, it's in the logos of the World Bank and, and so on, whereas the planetary, uh, for, Sp for Spivak, <coughs> excuse me, is about the subaltern and it's about, actually it's about places and it's about um, resistance and, and, and the ground that we stand on. And so I quite, I, I quite like that idea I mean, you can use whatever words you like in a way, but the idea that you could think about a way of talking about a collective belonging on, I guess, the earth or the planet uh, that that's, uh, has a, a different kind of relation uh, than capitalism, which is so often portrayed as so hegemonic. And then other scholars, certainly in the environmental sp sphere, do invoke the, the, the planetary in very visceral ways. I mean, w there's been a lot of uh, research uh, on planetary boundaries around climate crisis, but I think it is quite significant that this year scientists reported that we have actually 
measurably, demonstrably past uh, chemical and plastics pollution planetary boundaries. And by that, it means that it's, it's, it's pushed uh, the, the, the levels of, of sustainability on, on Earth or, or functioning on Earth uh, to dangerous levels where, yeah, it's, it's raining chemicals. It's, it, those are the kinds of headlines that, that you sort of see. So I take... As a, as a starting point, I guess, um, the petrochemical industry as, as, an, as an exemplary aspect of planetary industrial ruination. And as, you know, connected to the climate crisis and the, what, what many call the Anthropocene, although there, there are different criticisms uh, with regard to, you know, those, those kinds of uh, terms, especially in terms of who's responsible. And I... I argue that it's a, a very, um, I guess in some ways obvious, but under-examined uh, problem, the, the suffusion of toxicity around our world. Uh, this is where the images would have been <laughs> more, more useful to have from, from the slides, but I hope you could just uh, imagine and, and stay with me. Uh, so, I mean, some of the examples are, are the deadly disasters uh, that have been so, um, you know, spectacular uh, in, in, a, in a negative way uh, and uh, deadly and, and uh, violent uh, from Love Canal to uh, Seveso in Italy. Bhopal was the worst industrial uh, disaster in history in 1984. And more, these are also happening all, you know, in China more recently in Tianjin. Hundreds uh, died in explosions in 2015 and uh, in Jiangsu province in 2019 as well. So there are these deadly disasters that are, you know, inc increasingly occurring. Um, but there's also the everyday slow violence um, of, of uh, toxic pollution and contamination and exposures uh, and uh, the increasing uh, uh, effects on workers as well as communities. It's also exemplary in terms of injustice. So all around the world, so there's you know, thousands of sites of petrochemical manufacturing, and those are all, I mean, there are exceptions in terms of where which countries they're located in, but many, the majority of them are located in, in close proximity uh, to low-income, working class, and, and minoritized communities. This has been going on for, for decades and hasn't changed. So there are many around the world cancer alleys uh, that, that uh, I mean, although Louisiana's case is, is very um, well, I guess, well known within some uh, circles of people who uh, think about these issues, I, it's, it's actually, you know, the, uh, the case that there are many that are not, not known about. So that links to these issues that, that we talked about yesterday about the visibility of, of, of these injustices. I think pertinent uh, in, in relation to the jobs um, versus community or environment debates in, in deindustrialization, uh, one, one of the key concepts that's been talked about is the idea of job, job blackmail, where, where people, uh, workers accept worse conditions uh, for their jobs. Um, but there are also uh, global labor injustices. So, uh, like basically close to slave-like labor uh, of, of migrant uh, workers in, in uh, Saudi Arabia uh, it, with huge, huge numbers, like thousands of, of, of workers uh, in, in these plants where you know, they forfeit their passports, they're um, sometimes shot by police if they uh, pr protest. Uh, uh, so it, it's, it's a very unequal global uh, uh, context of, of the labor. Uh, and I think, I, I mean, it does link to what I talked about in, in, in Industrial Ruination book around ambivalent nostalgia, but it, there, I think there's also increasingly, as we found in our research, in Grangemouth in Scotland around noxious deindustrialization, there's like an increasingly broken 
social contract between the, the employer uh, and, and the workers, uh, where often the workers don't live close to the plants anymore, they don't have those um, you know, social clubs and, and ben benefits, there's increasing use of subcontracting, there's a, a declining labor force, so you have this paradoxical situation of a thriving industry, but a contracting uh, and dehumanized uh, work workforce, where actually the, the, the communities that live close to the plants are, in, in many cases, Grangemouth is quite a startling example, are, are really fed up and uh, really angry about, uh, in, in, the, in the case of Grangemouth, like the, one of the richest men in the world, uh, a billionaire, and then they're living in... Uh, uh, with huge amounts of no noise and air pollution, can't get access to the jobs, uh, and uh, there's no, no real sort of... And, uh, you know, there is a nostalgia for their or earlier days. Uh, so, in, in some ways, I think one way of thinking about this, borrowing from contemporary archaeology, is this idea of sort of toxic heritage, the idea that this is... This is a kind of industrial heritage, uh, but it's toxic uh, and it's uh, harmful and it's, and it's a legacy of, of harms that humans have created. And how do we research and understand that? And you know, still pay respect to and recognize uh, all the, you know, the attachments and, and traumas and complexities of, of people who do, do depend on those um, work, workplaces. So this is one of the most difficult to decarbonize and really sticky kinds of industries. So, so if you think about uh, petrochemicals, they comprise more than 95% of all manufactured goods. The, the classic line in the industry is that, is that you know, everything is essential. We completely depend on, on what, what they produce. Um, there's widespread societal dependence. So that makes it very difficult to change. There's... Uh, direct and indirect livelihoods related to that. And there's also, I mean, researching um, places, I mean, I've involved, been involved in some environmental health campaigns and, and justice um, ideas in places like actually revisiting Marseille, uh, where locals are actually quite, some locals are, at, are quite resistant to uh, outsiders coming in, uh, not myself, but uh, other teams who, who would come into a, a place and do environmental health research, uh, do studies of the fish, do sort of citizen science, and say, you know, we are our place, we are the fish that we eat, and so our fish are contaminated, but we kind of live with that. And so there's a kind of, yeah, there, there are, you know, local context to understand uh, in terms of agency as well, and in, in terms of how people relate to that. Uh, and yeah, there, there are many interconnections, not just, I think, with humans, but also with um, non-human worlds as well. So one of the examples is that, um, you know, there's many ca campaigns to just get rid of all the plastics in the ocean. But if you take out the microplastics, many organisms are, have formed synergetic relationships with them. And so it's difficult to extract. Uh, so... Given I don't, don't have the, the PowerPoints, I'm just going to move straight, straight on uh, to the, 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 the provocative question that I'm going to raise that may go down really uh, not very well, um, which is, I mean, so I've been researching this industry uh, in multiple scales, and I think, yeah, many people who live in a, and work in and have commitments to a community that relies on petrochemical industry for jobs would, would you know, disagree. But I think that there needs to be downscaling uh, in this toxic and harmful industry. Uh, and I think, and I, I think it needs to be done in a different way. So I think, I mean, you can believe what you want in terms of what's going to happen, but we are in the context <laughs> where governments around the world are, are declaring this race to net zero, where there are intensifying decarbonization pressures, uh, and a lot of that has focused on fossil fuel dependent communities. So coal is the sort of signature case of, of just transition um, debates or energy transition debates. Uh, but to get to net zero, we need to also focus on the top four 
hard to abate industries, which include iron and steel, petrochemicals, cement, and aluminium. And so I think there is a, a, the case that there will be future deindustrialization that's brought about through uh, environmental crisis and, and just transitions. Uh, but one thing that really strikes me uh, looking at research on just transitions is that that almost always, at least as far as I've seen, happens after there have been job losses. So in the petrochemical industry, you have very rare, rarely these debates about just transitions unless there's a, cl a closure. And then it's, oh, we need to then ensure that there's a, a just transition for people. Uh, and I think in thinking about just transitions, that there needs to be a sense in which these could be anticipated. We could anticipate just transitions. We could uh, anticipate uh, and manage them better and, and uh, democratize that process. I mean, that sounds highly idealistic because that's often um, co-opted by technocratic and market interests and so on. And there's a history of profoundly unjust transitions. I mean, I think that's what you could say a lot of deindustrialization is. And it's interesting, I've been, I, I operate in different spaces. So I was recently in a, a climate policy debate where, or, or lecture where um, climate, UK climate policy analysts were saying, you know, an unintended but positive consequence of Thatcher's uh, destruction of the mining industry was that it was good for the climate. Of course, Thatcher never intended that. Uh, I had, didn't have climate policy on the agenda and, and Thatcher, you know, is, uh, you know, hugely problematic in terms of the, the history of, of uh, social justice. Uh, it was a profoundly un unjust transition and that's what's happened in many cases of transition deindustrialization and, and post-communist transition, many transitions. And so how can we think about the resources, I would ask, from studying the history of deindustrialization, from studying the history of structural change in the past and in the present, for thinking about the future? How might it equip us uh, for thinking about the future? So I'll just, uh, linking back <laughs> to revisiting that work, what lessons um, from deindustrialization studies or from the study of industrial ruination as a process um, could we think about for planetary just transformations? And I use the word transformations as opposed to transitions to indicate something more, more broad or radical or justice oriented rather than technical, but transitions is okay too. Uh, so one is attention to intergenerational memories and knowledges. And I think an important research question is, how do we actually study longer time scales? Um, so the, the, the deindustrialization studies is, has been really good about a particular series of time where there have, has been industry to reckon with and uh, the rise and fall of industries. But that in the scale of deep time and even in the scale of human history is a relatively brief period. And many um, places in, in China, for example, where we uh, went to petrochemical places People were more nostalgic, actually, about when they grew pineapples, which was only like 30 years ago. Uh, so there's, um, you know, interweaving histories as well. Uh, I think the importance of place-based understanding is, is really crucial uh, about the complexity and the diversity of lived experiences through and the recognition of that it is a difficult a process that's not universal, although it might there are common elements. And awareness, actually, that through any process of change, it's more likely that, that the people who are already disadvantaged and marginalized will be, uh, in turn, um, disadvantaged and dispossessed. That's um, uh, what's happened in the past. And so how, how can you be attentive to that to raise awareness of that or to fight back against that? Uh, that, that awareness is something that you know, could guide uh, future interventions or, or, or work. And I think the networks and resources of solidarity and resistance, so working class solidarity and resistance, uh, there are many uh, histories as well, although some of them have been forgotten about uh, alliances between uh, um, working class movements and environmental activists uh, and, and uh, you know, a whole range of different kinds of struggles, what I call in the book multiscalar activism.
um, in shaping those politics of industrial transformation and not just sort of saying, well, we get kind of, it's, it's something that's imposed from the top or from more powerful structures, like to actually put, insert um, those, those uh, voices of resistance, those, those um, actions in the process. And then finally, just um, restoring, yeah, the idea of hope or creativity, uh, innovation, imagination in, um, yeah, what, what uh, that, that uh, environmental justice uh, scholar said, you know, renewing and recentering the profound connections to place. I think that's a, a really, um, yeah, I guess an inspiring but difficult um, thing to, to take forward. So thank you. Thank you.